Imagine a drug that's become five times stronger in 30 years without anyone noticing. A drug that can trigger schizophrenia in teenagers, but only if they have the wrong genes. A drug that 9 out of 10 people can use recreationally, but 1 in 10 can't quit. That drug exists. It's marijuana, and it's more dangerous now than it's ever been. But here's the twist. The very laws designed to protect us may have made it deadlier. Today, we're investigating the hidden risks of marijuana that legalization advocates don't want you to hear and the hidden failures of prohibition that critics don't want to admit. Your brain has a built-in system for regulating mood, memory, pain, and appetite. It's called the endocannabinoid system, and it works through receptors scattered throughout your body. CB1 receptors are concentrated in your brain, while CB2 receptors sit mainly in immune tissues. These receptors respond to molecules your body naturally produces to keep things balanced. THC, the main psychoactive compound in marijuana, mimics these natural molecules. But instead of maintaining balance, it overloads the CB1 receptors in your brain. This overactivation is what causes the marijuana high. Euphoria, distorted time perception, impaired memory, and slowed coordination. CBD, another major compound in cannabis, works completely differently. It doesn't strongly bind to these receptors. Instead, it acts more like a moderator, dampening some of THC's more intense effects. This is why cannabis with balanced levels of both THC and CBD tends to produce a calmer experience with less anxiety and paranoia. Here's where things get concerning. The cannabis plant used to contain both compounds in relatively balanced amounts. In 1995, a typical strain had a THC to CBD ratio of about 1 to 14, meaning there was actually more CBD than THC. By 2014, that ratio had completely inverted to roughly 1 to 80. Today's cannabis is overwhelmingly THC dominant, with modern strains containing 25 to 30% THC in flower form and 60 to 90% in concentrates. CBD has been almost entirely bred out. This isn't just a gradual change, it's a fundamental transformation of the drug itself, and that transformation has consequences. For most people, cannabis doesn't cause psychosis, but for some, it can trigger something devastating. If you carry certain genetic variants, particularly ones that affect how your brain processes dopamine, heavy use of high THC cannabis can trigger or accelerate schizophrenia. People with a family history of schizophrenia face the highest risk. A 2019 study across European cities found that in London, roughly 30% of first episode psychosis cases were linked to high potency cannabis. In Amsterdam, where the strongest strains are widely available, that figure reached 50%. Daily users of high-potency cannabis faced about three times the risk of developing a psychotic disorder. The mechanism is straightforward. THC floods your brain's dopamine pathways. Most people's brains can handle this. But if you're genetically vulnerable, your brain can't regulate the flood. What might have remained a latent vulnerability becomes an active, life-altering illness. Timing matters too. Using cannabis before age 18, when your brain is still developing, significantly increases the risk of schizophrenia later in life. Here's the twist. CBD appears to offer some protection. Research suggests it has antipsychotic properties, and cannabis with balanced THC and CBD ratios produces far fewer reports of paranoia and psychotic symptoms. But black market economics eliminated CBD. Dealers bred for maximum THC because that's what gets people high and drives sales. CBD took up space without adding psychoactive punch, so growers systematically removed it. Legal regulation could reverse this. Governments can mandate minimum CBD levels, require clear THC to CBD labeling, or cap potency entirely. Uruguay, for example, limits legal cannabis to 9% THC and requires 1% CBD. These aren't arbitrary numbers. They're designed to reduce the risk of psychosis while still allowing adult use. Under prohibition, no such protections exist. In 1975, cannabis averaged 2 to 4% THC. Today, flour commonly reaches 15%. Concentrates hit 90%. This follows the iron law of prohibition. When enforcement intensifies, traffickers favor higher potency per unit volume. 
During alcohol prohibition, beer and wine gave way to moonshine. Smugglers wanted maximum alcohol per bottle to justify the risk. Cannabis followed the same logic. Marijuana growers operating illegally bred for maximum THC per gram. Higher potency meant higher prices and fewer shipments needed for profit. CBD offered no advantage, so market forces eliminated it. The Netherlands provides evidence. Dutch coffee shops have semi-legally sold cannabis since the 1970s, but cultivation remained illegal, so organized crime supplied the product. Without regulatory oversight, growers optimized for potency. By the 2000s, most Dutch coffee shop cannabis was 15 to 20% THC with minimal CBD. Treatment admissions tracked the rise. In the Netherlands, first-time cannabis treatment entries jumped from roughly 7 per 100,000 population in 2000 to 26 per 100,000 in 2010, nearly quadrupling as average THC doubled. When some coffee shops later sourced slightly lower potency product, admissions declined. Most heroin users tried marijuana first. But most marijuana users never touch heroin. Studies find only about 1 in 20 cannabis users go on to try cocaine. The RAND Corporation found that drug initiation sequences could be explained by common factors – childhood trauma, untreated mental illness, genetic addiction predisposition, deviant peer groups, and early tobacco and alcohol use. Adolescents who smoke tobacco or drink alcohol by ages 13 or 14 face significantly higher risks of later using illicit drugs, including cannabis. Cannabis often comes first because it's more available. Opportunity and propensity drive progression, not a chemical gateway. But there's a different gateway, the illegal market. Under prohibition, buying cannabis means interacting with dealers who often sell multiple drugs. Contact creates exposure. The Netherlands tested whether separating cannabis from hard drugs would break this link. Since 1976, coffee shops have sold cannabis but are strictly forbidden from selling other substances. If marijuana biologically led to heroin, Dutch heroin addiction should have exploded. Instead, Dutch rates remained among Europe's lowest. Portugal went further. In 2001, facing a severe heroin epidemic, Portugal decriminalized possession of all drugs. Users faced health panels, not jail. The government invested in treatment and harm reduction. The results? Heroin addiction dropped from roughly 100,000 in the late 1990s to around 25,000 by 2018, a 75% reduction. Overdose deaths plummeted to one-tenth the UK rate and one-fiftieth the US rate. HIV infections among people who inject drugs fell more than 90%. Cannabis use among Portuguese youth did not spike. The gateway is the environment prohibition creates, not the molecule. About 9-10% to 10 of people who ever use marijuana develop cannabis use disorder. Among people starting in early teens, about 17% eventually develop addiction. For daily users, dependency rates climb to between 25 and 50%. The World Health Organization estimated around 13 million people worldwide had cannabis dependence in 2010. In the United States in 2020, about 4.8 million people had diagnosed cannabis use disorder. Withdrawal is real. Heavy users who quit experience irritability, anxiety, insomnia, appetite loss, and mood swings. Tolerance also develops. Users need larger amounts to achieve the same effect. Higher potency products drive higher addiction rates. Netherlands data showed as average THC rose from roughly 9% in the late 1990s to 16% in the late 2000s. Treatment admissions for cannabis problems quadrupled. For comparison, tobacco has about a 32% addiction rate. Heroin is around 23%. Cocaine, roughly 17%. Alcohol, about 15%. Cannabis, at 9 to 10%, ranks lower but still traps millions. Prohibition hasn't prevented these addictions. It just prevented people from seeking help without legal fear. In Portugal, after decriminalization, treatment uptake increased because stigma dropped. Chronic cannabis smoking irritates lungs. Heavy users often develop bronchitis symptoms, persistent cough, phlegm, wheezing. Whether marijuana smoke causes lung cancer remains unclear, but cannabis smoke contains many of the same carcinogens as tobacco smoke. Cannabis causes transient cardiovascular effects. In people with existing heart disease, the strain can be dangerous. Research found heart attack risk increases roughly 4.8-fold in the hour following cannabis use in susceptible individuals. 
The teenage brain is especially vulnerable. Persistent heavy cannabis use interferes with prefrontal cortex development. A long-term New Zealand study found persistent heavy users from teens showed a decline of roughly 8 IQ points by age 38. Memory, attention, and processing speed all show deficits. Regular cannabis smokers show significantly worse periodontal health. Research found people who use cannabis at least weekly for 15 years were about three times as likely to have severe gum disease. Cannabis hyperemesis syndrome affects some long-term heavy users, cycles of severe nausea and vomiting. The only cure is stopping cannabis entirely, yet cannabis has never caused a fatal overdose. Alcohol causes roughly 3 million deaths globally each year. Tobacco kills more than 6 million. Cannabis's direct mortality toll is zero. When Colorado legalized recreational cannabis in 2014, opponents predicted teen use explosions and crime spikes. Neither happened. Colorado surveys show no significant increase in adolescent cannabis use post-legalization. In Canada, usage among 16 to 19-year-olds rose initially after 2018 legalization, then fell to 25% by 2021, significantly lower than the 44% recorded in 2018. Legal stores check IDs rigorously. Illegal dealers never did. Crime rates didn't spike. Colorado studies found no increase in cannabis-related impaired driving or violent crime. Adult use rose modestly, about 24% more frequent use in legal states. Cannabis arrests dropped 80 to 99% in legalized states, sparing tens of thousands from criminal records. Colorado now sees more than $2 billion in annual cannabis sales, generating hundreds of millions in tax revenue allocated to schools and healthcare. Emergency room visits for acute cannabis reactions increased. People experiencing severe anxiety after consuming high-dose edibles. Some legal markets saw a THC arms race driven by profit motives, but where taxes were reasonable and stores accessible, legal markets captured large shares. Legal products are lab tested and labeled. The 2019 EVLI vaping lung injury outbreak was overwhelmingly linked to black market THC cartridges containing toxic additives, not regulated products. Alcohol and tobacco are legal, heavily regulated, and still cause staggering harm. But we don't ban them because alcohol prohibition in the 1920s failed catastrophically. Instead, we manage them through age minimums, warning labels, advertising restrictions, drunk driving laws, smoke-free zones, high taxes, treatment programs, and public education campaigns. Cannabis regulation follows the same framework. Age limits keep products out of legal reach for minors. Product testing ensures purity. THC and CBD percentages must be disclosed. Canada limits edibles to 10 thousand milligrams of THC per package. Uruguay caps legal cannabis at roughly 9% THC and requires about 1% CBD. Canada's Cannabis Act bans advertising that appeals to youth and requires plain packaging with health warnings. Health agencies publish lower-risk cannabis use guidelines, science-based recommendations for safer consumption, None of these tools exist under prohibition. The arguments against marijuana legalization rest on real evidence. Psychosis in genetically vulnerable users, addiction in roughly 10% cognitive harm to developing brains, respiratory and cardiovascular strain, these risks are documented. But prohibition didn't prevent these harms. It amplified some through the potency paradox, blocked research for decades, funded organized crime, filled prisons, and prevented honest education. The scientific conclusion, marijuana carries risks, especially for youth and heavy users. Those risks are better managed through regulation, education, and healthcare than through criminalization. Not because cannabis is harmless, because prohibition is more harmful. If you're still here, thank you for being part of this journey. Subscribe to stay tuned for what's next.